started. We welcome those of you who may be watching with us at home on Facebook or later on on YouTube or wherever you might be watching us. Uh, we're glad to have you for prayer meeting this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started here. Father God, we love you. Lord God, we're, thankful. we're so thankful for today, for the many things that you're doing in our hearts. Lord God, for the fact, first of all, that because you've allowed us to put our faith in Jesus Christ, you are living in our hearts. And Father God, you're here with us in everything we go through, even before and, and while we may or may not realize. You're with us. And thank you for that. Lord God, we thank you that you're working in our hearts with good fellowship. And we thank you for the meal that we've enjoyed tonight, so many of us. And Lord, we thank you, Father, for the, the time our students are having over at camp in Texas and uh, the many things you're working in their hearts as well. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ as well as the people who have not yet come to Christ that, that we're aware of, that, that we uh, are going to lift up to you throughout the world, someone that we don't even know and never may meet. Lord God, in all of it, we thank you that we can pray your will and your power and your strength into the situations that they face, just like it's, uh, those things are in our, the situations that we face. So, Lord God, tonight, let us be faithful in prayer. Let us always be faithful in prayer, both in church and so much more even outside the church. And Father, in all of it, let us glorify you and give you the glory you so richly deserve and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, all right, guys, we've got a prayer list right there. If you've got a copy of it in front of you, let's take a look at it. There's not a, a ton of updates, uh, but you might have some additions as well as some updates today. Um, we do want to continue to lift up Miss Jean Cockrell. That's uh, Miss Kitty Barlow's friend uh, from high school that is uh, going through a heart procedure. Uh, so we want to continue to pray for her that that would be effective and that would help her and that they could get her back to health as well. Uh, Bob Harris, Brother Bob, has gone home. Uh, he has not had the, the transplant yet, um, but uh, so he's, he's made some improvement, but he's at home, so praying that, that he's doing well. Miss Sue, any update today on Bob? Oh, bless his heart. Wayne, you got to stop sharing those with people, man. What's the deal? Oh. How's Casey doing? Is she doing better? Sure. Bless her. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes mean for us guys is just payback, you know, you just never know. So, no. Good. Yeah, well, we're, we're praying for her, but also that, that's Casey Harris, or, well, Casey Furlow now. I, she'll always be Casey Harris to me and probably to her daddy. But anyway, uh, so uh, but she's, she's been dealing with a, a pretty large kidney stone here the last several days, well, over a week. Um, but then also praying for Bob Harris as well. Um, and then also Dosha Shorter, um, who has COVID. So how's she doing? She's better. I talked to her yesterday, but Robert Earl came over um, Monday, and I had to do a COVID home test for him. He has it. Oh, bless. Well, that's kind of how that goes, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it just gets shared more and more. It's still out there. It's not quite as widespread as it was at one time, but it's still out there. So pray for Dosha, and, and, and you said her husband as well. Yes. Glad that she's doing better, though. All right. And then also, um, down there at the bottom, there's, there's two groups that we wanted to lift up. Uh, we mentioned, of course, those in Texas that had, uh, had you know, had, had the shooting and, and, and the families of the, of the children that were killed, as well as the, the teachers that were killed, uh, as well as the family of, of the shooter, you know, and, and, and remembering all that whole community. But also many more. We just put down there this on the prayer list this evening, victims of violence, because there's so much going on everywhere. It's not, you know, you wouldn't wish it on one community, but wouldn't it be nice if it only happened one place, right? But it happens everywhere. And so we want to lift up all those victims that are dealing with that type of violence and even close to us, not, not even just across state lines, sometimes, in, sometimes not even across county lines. So we want to lift them up. And then also we talked a little bit last Wednesday evening about uh, some of the situations going on in and around our Southern Baptist Convention. So we want to lift up the Southern Baptist Convention, especially the Executive Council that has to uh, make decisions. Uh, many of that Executive Council, if not most of them, are, uh, are not paid. So uh, they're, they're like you when you take on a position of responsibility, ministry, and leadership in our church. 
Um, they've done the same thing at our convention level. And so uh, many good men and women, godly men and women who have not done anything wrong, let's pray for them as they make up for and, and come in and try to prevent any further wrongdoing from being done. We did, uh, we did take James Radbury off of our prayer list and put James Rayberry on there. So any, any update on James Ray? <laughs> Is he doing okay? Well, pray that, pray that he gets, gets uh, doing well. Okay. Hmm. Okay. My, is it Mike Owen or Mike Owens? Owen. Yeah. Okay. Is this Jerry Crother? And things went well, they said. Uh, Grady was telling me that, that everything went well with that procedure and everything's doing well. So we'll remember to lift up Andy Presley. I have several to add. Lisa Burr, someone I, I met at New Zion. Mm-hmm. B-U-R-R? Um, B-U-R-R. She is Taylor Everett's mother, if a lot of people know Taylor, uh, from being in music and children's sure. ministry. I don't know exactly what, what happened to her, but she aspirated into her lungs. Oh, goodness. So they had her on vent, and they took her off, like, maybe earlier this week. But she had to go back on today. Ooh. So Lisa's hand? Yeah, yeah. So she is back on? Put her back on the vent today. Mm. Um, and then Ms. Cockrell, and I believe she's married to Neil Cockrell, passed away. Her son is Jimmy that lives on. Down the road, kind of from me, right where you turn to go to New Zion. He's got a house there. So that you said that's Miss Cockrell. Mrs. Cockrell. Uh, do you know I her first name? Neil. I don't remember her first name. Okay. So you think Neil Cockrell is the one? The wife. He's, it's, that's his wife. I okay. And then um, a Rita Welch Ross. Brett sent me a text and asked me, "Did I know her? She was killed this morning in, in, in Braxton or something. And it wasn't anybody I knew, but then Ken said her." her Oh, good. And then, if you know who Alec Kendrick is, the movie producer that does basically the Kendrick Brothers, yeah. You know, he was on Facebook today and asked that we pray for Elijah Anderson, a little, I don't know how old the child is, I don't remember, but uh, friends of his little boy. And then, okay. if you remember Shirley Williams, mm -hmm. she's going for like her second round of treatment. All right. I got good news, bad news. I guess the one thing you got to have surgery. Brandon, he finally went back and had a hip with that yesterday. Oh, no, it was more. Okay. And uh, he's going to have surgery on that. Not this Friday, but the next. That's Brandon Barlow, of course. When's, uh, when, when's he going to, have they scheduled it yet? They, 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 he went yet this morning. To, to get checked out for it. They scheduled surgery for a week from Friday. Week from Friday, okay. All right. I think I saw where Jason Eichhorst was back in the hospital. Has anybody heard anything yeah, from Jason? He's, he's back home? Okay. Good. All right. Any other updates or additions? Evan? Uh, my two sister-in-laws. Okay. J.D. Cobb. She's no longer in the hospital. She is at home. Okay. My other sister-in-laws, Connie Asherman, which is, she was in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And she is back. Okay. And it's Asherman, isn't it? M-A-N. Okay. Uh, and she's home. She's home. They're Good. Home. Um, better to be healing and recovering at home than, than have to be in a hospital or a nursing home. 
Okay. All right. Any other updates or additions? Ms. Helen? I got eight treatments left. Eight treatments left. Counting them down. How many did it start off to be? 26? 23. 23. Well, you're looking good, so it looks like it's, looks like it's doing well. I mean, you know, Grady came out looking a little funny, you know, so that's <laughs> just kidding. Oh, right, well, that's all right. You know, that reminds me of a story my dad tells. He, he had a head injury not too long ago, well, it was a few years ago now, and, uh, and, and he, he hit his head on a pipe underneath his kitchen sink when he was repairing something and blacked out and flooded the kitchen. It was bad. Uh, he had a brain bleed. And so... The, uh, you know, they were checking him out and kind of getting him back going. I think he had gone back for his checkup, I think is the way the story went. And the, the nurse was talking to him and said, well, Mr. Mayfield, you, you know, have you had any, you know, any issues, anything you noticed that maybe, you know, memory's gone, you know, things you can't do anymore? And he said, ma'am, I'm having a really hard time playing the piano. <laughs> and she said, oh, well, no, well, what do you mean? He said, I can't play the piano. And, uh, and she said, so, so you could, I mean, were you a piano player before? Oh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. <laughs> My dad loves telling that story. Well, yes, ma'am. My nephew, Jack Porter, he did say yes and no to the nurse. Oh, wow. Very good. So he's, he's continuing to improve. Now. Okay, so he's, he's out of the hospital. Yes, and he's in a long-term facility, so they feel like he's making some progress. Good. All right. Oh, the, Brother David Sartner? Oh, no. Goodness. Noreen, have you heard from Miss Lisa? Have you hadn't heard that? Okay. Well, let's lift up Brother David. I got to see him the other day at Miss Amy's funeral, and uh, he, he, he was behind the pulpit. He got to preach. For the first time, he said in a little over a year, and uh, he, uh, he did a, good, a really good job. So glad for that. All right. Well, folks, if you don't have any more updates and additions, oh yes, ma'am, Miss Ethel. Um, one of my babies, um, one of my sisters is going to have a knee replacement next week. Big problems. Yeah. Um, and then she's going to have to have an ankle replacement. All right. Any other updates and additions? All right, well then now, if you will, circle up. If you're watching with us at home, if you'll just find the place where you are safely to pray, and uh, take just a moment and pray for the Lord, ones that the Lord will put on your heart this evening.
Lord God, we again thank you for the opportunity that we have that you give us and the commandment that you give us to pray for one another and for those who, uh, who, who you put upon our hearts. Lord God, in all of these situations, Lord, we pray your will. We, we know that your will is perfect, your will is right, your will is holy, and your will is best. So, Lord God, we pray your will in each and every situation. We thank you this evening, Lord God, that it be in your will to provide comfort and strength, peace, even in the time of loss and distress, disease, hurt, heartbreak, and all the many things we face. Lord God, would you work in a way that has to be explained as being you and only you in the lives of each the one that we've mentioned tonight, each one we've prayed for tonight in our time of prayer, and each one that is in our mind and our heart, whether we mention them or not. Father God, would you work your will because we trust you to do well. Father, even when you do, you work your will and we don't fully understand it. We thank you that we trust you and we know that you are working things to the good. Father, don't let those be empty words. Don't let those be hollow sayings. But Father, let us come to truly, moment by moment, day by day of our lives, trust you more and more. And to see how faithful you are. Lord, to see how powerful you are. And Lord, to see how good your will really is. Father God, we thank you for the time that we've been able to spend here these last few weeks in the book of First Peter. And Lord God, as we wrap up and, and talk a little bit, Father, would you open our hearts and open our mouths as well. Father, to share some of the things that you've taught us, some of the things that you're working on in each of our hearts. Father, don't let us be bashful. Don't let us be afraid. Don't let us hold back. Don't let us buy into the lie that, well, we just don't talk about our faith in public. Certainly amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ that love us and love you, we can feel free to discuss the things that you're working on, to ask questions, to, uh, to, to make observations about what you're doing in and through your word, Father, as it impacts our life. So, Lord God, in this time, would you, uh, would you loosen our tongues that we might be able to talk um, and, and grow and help each other to grow. Father, as we share what, you, what you've taught us here in the book of First Peter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we just prayed, we, uh, we just wrapped up our series called Exiles, uh, Hope from First Peter. And, uh, and so normally on a Sunday evening after we wrap up a series, we would go back and, and kind of recap it and, and get you, you know, give you an opportunity to share maybe what the Lord has, has put on your hearts and what he taught you and how he's working on you through those messages. And I think, uh, folks, it's more and more important that we do that because so often we sit in church services and, and we, we hear the word. Maybe, maybe God does some great things in our heart, but so often it, it seems to stop right there. And no one else knows what he's do, done in your heart. Nobody else hears what he's done in your heart. Um, outside of the word itself, far better than my explaining or even preaching the word is your experience with the word. Um, your experience with the word ministers in a far better way uh, than any of, any of my or any other preacher's preaching ever could. Uh, because your experience is real. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact... It won't be perfect because you're like all of us. Uh, you're a person. <laughs> and the only perfection that we have is, is the Lord within us. And he's working in us to perfect us, but we're not perfect just yet. Uh, and so I encourage you in just a few moments when we have an opportunity to tell us what, uh, you know, what hope did you find in the book of First Peter over the last five weeks? Um, what obstacles are you facing in trying to deal with some of the things and the topics that the Lord spoke on through Peter in that letter uh, and in that book of the Bible for us. Uh, what are some things that you hope to grow in? What are some things that you hope to maybe, uh, maybe some habits or some thoughts or some attitudes you hope to lay down? Uh, don't, don't hold back when it's your time to share in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we get there, so also to let you kind of let that percolate in you just a few minutes, uh, just to kind of recap, uh, you remember that the book of First Peter, it is a letter, it's an epistle from Peter the Apostle, who used to be Simon, who was uh, one of uh, the three closest of the twelve to Jesus, um, who we hear and read a lot about in the Gospels. Uh, scholars even believe that he is the source, the primary source for Mark's Gospel, because Mark is mentioned in, in the last part of First Peter, and, uh, and so as, as, a, as a brother of his, a, a brother in Christ that is, and so uh, the book of Mark is attributed to being somewhat Peter's gospel, if you want to say it that way. 
uh, he was amongst the closest. And so as, a, as an apostle and as a pastor, um, he took the occasion prompted by the Spirit to write a letter uh, to the church, to uh, the local church, but to all local churches, to encourage them in times of persecution, to remind them of who they are, of whose they are in Christ, and to remind them of their calling. And as we've talked about, and as the name of the, the sermon series denoted, uh, he calls the church, he calls the believers in Christ, he calls Christians elect exiles. Elect in that they have been chosen by God, set apart in their salvation, uh, and exiles in that they are not living in their home country because their home country, their citizenship, because of their salvation, because of their faith, is in heaven. And so they are in a foreign land being here in this world, uh, which is true now of anyone who bears the name of Christ, who has put, who has put their faith in Jesus. We are all still elect exiles. We're still in the exact same situation, um, you know, positionally as the people that Peter was writing to. And uh, as part of being elect exiles, everything doesn't always go the way we'd love for it to go. We know that there's a time when it will all go way better than we think it will, you know, should go. Uh, and that'll be our time of eternity in heaven with the Lord. But in the meantime, we face sufferings. We face trials. We face persecution. And we find ourselves in need of growing hope and, to play a little play on words, in growing need of hope, right? Because we, we you know, we're, we're in need of hope getting more and more, you know, prevalent in our life. But then also that need is, uh, you know, is, is growing more and more each and every day we live. Um, and so he, he gives this hope in the form of reminding them of who they are, challenging us and the believers that he was initially writing to, um, to be holy in the second half of chapter one, um, comparing their holiness to the Jesus who died for them, who they've put their faith in, uh, who now through the Holy Spirit is alive and in us as believers uh, and and he refers back to the Old Testament telling us to be holy because Jesus is holy and uh, and so the, he reminds us who we are and the calling that we've been given and how to humbly love one another humbly serve even to the point of giving respect to earthly authorities that may or may not be godly but are nonetheless uh, God allowed and to continue to show our submission to the Lord by showing respect and honor to the, even to the emperor, who was by far not godly, right? Uh, chapter 2, he continues to compare Jesus, or, or not really to compare, but to remind the readers, to remind Christians of Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Uh, there's a popular song that's been out in the last few years called Cornerstone. That's a, a great praise uh, song. I think we've done it at least once in our sanctuary. I think Steele's led it for us. Um, and, uh, but that's who Jesus is. And, and he, again, referring back to prophecy in the Old Testament uh, that refers to Jesus, talking about him as the chief cornerstone, the one that causes others to stumble, but also the one that we're built into. And in that chapter 2, he tells us that we, uh, that we are a chosen people in verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Um, and, and all of that, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's 1 Peter 2, 9, a great memory verse out of the book of 1 Peter. Um, and so he reminds us that God shows us that, he, that we're his, that the one who is the cornerstone, the one that on, on which everything else is laid and built and made right, um, we've been chosen and, and made brothers and sisters with that Jesus. And, uh, and then from there, he says, because of that, we need to live godly lives. We need to live different than the world around us because we are exiles here. We don't need to be, like we talked about in the last week of the ser sermon series, we don't need to be immigrants where we, you know, we make our life everything. It's all just about right here in this world. No, we are exiles. We are not in our home country. And he says to live that way out of submission and out of humility uh, he talks to wives, he talks to husbands, he talks to even to slaves about showing that humble submission to God by showing humble submission to one another. And then he starts to talk about the latter half of chapter 3, a lot more about suffering for what is right, suffering for our faith and our obedience to the Lord. And in the midst of that, he transitions into chapter 4, reminding us that as we suffer, it's because we start to look more and more like Christ 
when we suffer for being obedient to him as opposed to when we suffer for doing the wrong things, right? For, uh, just because we're having a bad time doesn't necessarily mean we're godly. But when we go through a bad time, a time of persecution or suffering because of our holy reverence and obedience to God, that's something we can glory in and even rejoice in because Jesus also went through the same thing. And, uh, and so as we suffer for being Christians in chapter 4, he reminds us that, that that's okay. Jesus said that would come. And if we're not suffering because of our faith, we might have to wonder, is our faith really showing to anybody? Uh, and not to say that suffering always comes from faith, but it often comes from faith. Um, and then in chapter 5, he wraps it up and he reminds us that, hey, we are all as believers, even through different places geographically, but also through different series and, and seasons of time, we're all in this together, and we're not alone. When we suffer, we don't suffer alone. When we rejoice, we don't rejoice alone. God is with us, and so are our brothers and sisters also in Christ. And so the, the, the core message of First Peter is to bring us hope so that we won't give up, so that we won't refer back to any other former parts of our lives before we were saved, and also so that as we mature in our faith, we won't refer back or revert back to the more immature times of our faith, that we would continue to grow, that we would stay the course, and that we would be encouraged as we do so. Um, as we look back at First Peter, I find a lot of hope in the idea that as we in our country um, can see a lot closer on the horizon a very real time where we might face real persecution for faith in Jesus Christ, um, more so than we've ever had to think about facing. I think books like First Peter put us in the right mindset if we take them to heart um, to be able to live in that world, in that time of our country, in that time of our, of our lives, and still be faithful to God and even grow in our faithfulness, which is what God encourages and commands and deserves, uh, even when we face persecution. So in our last few moments together tonight, what, what are some things that God put on your heart through the time in our, our time in First Peter together? What are some things that he's taught you? What are some challenges you've had with it, questions you've got? Comments. The floor is yours. What have you got? What Jesus gives us cannot be taken away. No, ma'am, that's right. That's exactly right. It is, it is done. When he said it's finished, it, it's not just put on a shelf. It's done. The debt is paid. Yes, ma'am. That'll preach, Miss Chris. What else? Miss Chris broke the ice. You don't have to go first now. Y'all don't have to arm wrestle over it. Just somebody start talking. It'll be all right. Either way. <laughs> Ladies first, Miss Sandy, you go ahead. The very, very first sermon I wrote down, and, and I like the, that our faith has future results. It's not necessarily immediate right now in front of me, you know, but it has future results. That's right. And then I liked it because I thought, okay, when I've been sharing Jesus with people at work all this time, I didn't realize that I was a vocational evangelist. Yes, you, you are. Said, you said that one. Yes, night. you I are. Thought, okay, that is cool. I, I, I like that. You know, that's really what all the what all the original pastors were. <laughs> you know. And then my, my last little note that I really like. Um, um, is the longer you are saved, the more you look like Jesus and less like you were before you. And that is, that is the goal, right? That's the, that's the way it should be. And when that's not the case, then that's time to repent and, and let him start back to being that, that, you know, that being the case. I see those notes in your notebook now. I mean, you, might, you might have better notes on the sermon than I do. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Well, that's for a, some reason, I mean, I have written, I mean, I've done it for years and years and years and years. You know. it's, a good, it's a great discipline to, be ha you know, to, to have in your life, that's and for sure. That was one of the funny things that Steve and I shared. Because when we were at church together, he was in that end of the same pew I sat on, and I was in this one. And Sunday, we both would pull out our little notebooks and write down, and I thought, well, not when we first started, but then when we started dating, I thought, okay, that is one of the things that we are long about, you know. You know, our, our, our notes are a lot better than our memory, aren't they? Well, definitely. Oh, we, uh, yeah, the memory you got. When, when Sherry and I started dating here, um, I was a hopeless romantic, you know, still might be a little bit. And, uh, and so for the first, uh, golly, many, many weeks, even months of our, of our dating life, I'd come home and write down a little notebook what we did that day. Even if we just talked on the phone or even if we just, you know, whatever, you know, I'd write it down. And so 
you know, that's moved, that notebook's moved with us. And we got to talking about it the other day and we wanted to show it to the girls and we couldn't find it. And, uh, and so Mallory needed some softball pants and Mackenzie had some uh, for, the, for when she played softball as, a, as an elementary student. And so we opened up boxes, you know, opened up tubs of old clothes trying to find it. We found everything Mackenzie, I think, had ever worn except for those softball pants. But one of those boxes we opened up and guess what was on top? That black five-star notebook. And it was right there and I got it out and then made the girls want to throw up and everything. It was great. <laughs> it was. But you know, you look back at it and things that definitely did and still do mean so much, you, don't, you can't remember them all. But when you read through, you know, uh, you know, there's that, that there's that movie, The Notebook. This is the Notebook. I don't know what that other no, no, notebook right. is. So, <laughs> that's right. Those old love letters. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when it's not when when we're not humble about it, it's more self-centered, and that's not that's not the hope that we are that we share with us in Christ. All right, how about in the back back there? Somebody back there, back on the back half. Anybody? All right, Ed, I'm sorry, Edmund, we skipped over you. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I jumped right in there. Go ahead, Edmund, after you. You don't, man. You don't. Always be ready. We should absolutely be prepared. And you know, you talk about never never thinking of a time when our own government would uh, you know, would look at Christians that way. But, uh, but, you know, that's the thing about representative government that, like we have. It represents the people. And as the people feel that way, they, those people that feel that way find their way into government. And leader, you know, they're elected. And, and they represent. You said, you said the representatives. That's exactly what they are. But. Everybody, everybody else's beliefs might be a little strange, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and it just, sometimes I think, well, I mean, just read the Bible. I mean, sometimes I just have to shake my head at some of the things they're saying and being done. But, you know, that's the new world. That's what everybody, you know. Well, and God gives us the truth of the word to not set us up to, you know, and I, I, this is not what I think you're saying, but but not to set us up in judgment of everybody else, but to give us the perspective of truth so that we can then act in love and mercy. You know, I don't know. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I just, I just, you know, I was raised up completely different than what I was raised up. And sure. And I don't, you know, I'm not here to judge by no means at all. I mean, we're all sinners. That's right. You know, I just, you know, I just can't understand sometimes though, how people believe the beliefs they have. Not to say that my beliefs are any better, you know, but I just, I just, I'm sad sometimes. 
Yeah. Sure. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? And it's not so much that people should believe like us, but we, if we if we know that we, you know, we we're, we're, we're following or basing our beliefs on, you know, uh, real events. I mean, real people. You know, Jesus lived. He died. He, you know, and and Scripture has been around longer than any other book. You know, and, and is in more wide circulation than any other book in the history of the planet. And, and you know, so it, it it just on a on a logical level, it it has some credentials that lend to believing it more than other books right or more than other belief systems and so it's it's proved itself out the word of god has over time and and so yeah i mean you know we we have reason to believe that it's true you know beyond even simply our faith and uh, but in our faith we 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 put our whole life into it being true and and live it out and it's opportunity I'm so thankful I'm to God. amen that's right I'm so and what makes us heartbroken and sad is when we see people that don't, isn't it? Yeah. And that, that motivates us to share that faith that we have and to live that out. That's right. I like something you said. You said we're blessed to a point that the angels are just a little bit jealous of us. Uh-huh. I'd love to claim that, but Peter said that, but I'm with you. I did repeat it. I did repeat it. So that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that teach something else. Well, they're not looking to lay down their life for Christ, right? No, no more than we're looking to be reincarnated into a better version of an animal. You know, I mean, it's just not the, the two don't cross our minds together. Uh, uh, could God have saved everyone that's ever existed? Absolutely. Um, he chose not to. He chose to give us the opportunity to respond to him. So why, you know, to answer the question a little shorter is why? Because people won't choose him. And we do, I believe, we do have free will. We, we have, he lets us have a part in that choice. And that's why the mission field's full, right? That's, that's why the, the fields are, are wide unto harvest, as Jesus said. That's why the workers are few. <laughs> um, but, but that means that those of us who have put our faith in Christ, who do have salvation, who have been born again, man, it's not, you know, we don't have time to play around with trivial matters and disputes and habits and traditions and all that stuff. That's why it's so important that we grow in our faith and share our faith and minister and, and share the gospel everywhere we can share it um, because he does allow us and employ us to be part of saving more and more not that we do the saving but that we get to be some of the vehicle through which the gospel you know travels and is shared so lots of hope lots of encouragement lots of challenge lots of rebuke even in first peter um, i hope you'll go back as you do with other books of the bible and reread it and look at some of those notes that you might have and in places where I didn't didn't get it through clear enough, that the Lord will clear that up even more and teach you more and more than I ever could. Um, and uh, praise the God that he does that for all of us. And he does that even when I look back over it after preaching it for a few weeks in each you know, of those, those books. So uh, let's, uh, let's continue to grow, continue to share the gospel as we go. Let's be encouraged and hopeful as we do. Uh, let me go to the Lord in prayer as we wrap us up. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for, for the salvation that you give us. And Father, if while we sit in here with that in common, so many of us, we know that we live in a world where that's not as common. So, Father, help us to shine with the light of Christ in us each and every day. And when we mess up, when we dim that light by our actions or our attitudes or our reactions or our, whatever we might do to get in the way, help us to be convicted by your Holy Spirit to repent and to come back to faithful sharing and obedience uh, of, of your word. Lord God, I pray for each person here, each one that's watching at home, Lord, that you would gird us up and that you would take us out and that you would keep us active in ministering to those around us, that they too, in your power and to your glory, might come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Help us to be all about that in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.